Hello everyone and welcome to Instant Biology by Dr. Nilab. Today we would be talking about the process of elongation of DNA replication. If you have seen my previous videos, we have already discussed about the process of initiation in DNA replication. So this would be a video in English. I have already made a video in Hindi. So if you are comfortable in the Hindi language, then you can switch over to that video. Otherwise, you can keep watching this video. So now without wasting much time let us start the elongation process of dna replication before getting into uh, elongation process let me just brief you about the process of initiation that we have already discussed i would uh, recommend you to watch that video before coming into uh, this video because then only this video would make sense to you so in the process of initiation we have said that there is a template double stranded uh, template dna and which needs to be copied and the initiation process marks the marks the starting or initialization of the process of replication in the process of initiation we had seen that uh, the enzymes that are required for the process of replication they assemble onto a particular site right and uh, we have also talked about uh, enzyme called as dna helicase we have also talked about the enzyme uh, primase we have also talked about the main enzyme that is uh, DNA polymerase so all these enzymes would come into being but first of all I would just like to briefly tell you about the primase now if you remember I have told you what primase is primase is an enzyme that synthesizes the primer now if you recall primer is what primer is a RNA strand short oligo RNA strand and uh, why is this RNA strand required? Because the DNA polymerase cannot start the synthesis from scratch. That is why it needs some short nucleotide strand to which it can add up the nucleotides in a stepwise manner. Now, uh, addition of these nucleotides in a stepwise manner is called as elongation, which we would be taking up in this uh, today's lecture. Now, in the first uh, point that you can see on your screen is it DNA elongation basically involves the catalysis or the step by step addition of DNTP units to a growing chain. Now you already know that primase has synthesized the primer. Okay. Now to this primer new DNTPs would be added and this would take place in a stepwise manner. Now what are these DNTPs? DNTPs are ATP, GTP, TTP, CTP. These all are nucleotides. You might be knowing about them, right? So these are all nucleotides that are gradually added onto the chain, growing chain. Okay. So this was the first point. Now let us talk about the second point. Second point involves that three prime OH group of the primer attacks the alpha phosphoryl group of incoming DNTP and pyrophosphate is removed now uh, in order to make you understand this let me show you a diagrammatic representation now look at this if you see this then this is a rntp what is this this is an rntp and this rntp is having a 3 prime oh this you can see okay but this rntp what happens is this rntp is present at the end nucleotide of the primer isn't it this rntp is present at the end nucleotide of the primer and what does this rntp do let me just show you over here so this suppose is a uh, what do you say this is the end of the primer let me just uh, assume this now what will happen this 3 prime oh this is the 3 prime OH, OH that is present at the 3 prime end. This is the 3 prime end. What does it do? It adds or it uh, attacks on the incoming DNTP. Now, if you see this, this is the sugar. This is the nitrogenous base and these are the 3 phosphates. Now, you know about these 3 phosphates. That means each DNTP is having 3 phosphates. You would be very well aware about that. Now what happens is that this 3 prime OH over here it will attack on the it will attack on the alpha phosphate. Now this is the alpha phosphate, this is the beta phosphate and this is the gamma phosphate. 
So, I am talking about this phosphate, this is the alpha, beta and gamma. So, what I am saying is this OH will attack on this phosphate over here and because of this what will happen, because of this what will happen, the alpha and the, B, the gamma and the beta phosphates would be removed from here gamma and the beta phosphates would be removed from here and there would be a bond formation between the OH of this and the phosphate of the next nucleotide, isn't it? So this if I say that this is the first nucleotide, this is the second nucleotide, then the second nucleotide is attacking on the third one and this is the bond that is being formed with the second and the third one. What is this bond called? This bond is called as the phosphodiester bond. Why are you calling it phosphodiester bond? Because this is a carbon, this over here is an oxygen and this is a phosphate. So you can see that this C, O and P. Next if you consider this O, O and this O is again joined with one C, so C, O, P, O, C bond. So this is one phosphoester bond, this is another phosphoester bond. So together they are termed as phosphodiester bond. Phosphodiester bond. So summarizing what I just showed you in the diagrammatic representation, I am just saying that the new DNTP that is coming in from outside and this is the DNTP that is present. Let us say that this is the DNTP of the uh, um, the this is the DNTP of the already formed chain, the last DNTP that was present in the the last uh, nucleotide that was present in the already formed chain, and this is the incoming uh, nucleotide that is present. Now the three prime OH of this uh, nucleotide it will attack on the alpha phosphate or, or alpha P group of the incoming DNTP. Because of this what will happen? The gamma and the beta phosphates will be removed and a phosphodiester bond will be formed between the OH, 3 prime OH of the already present nucleotide and the incoming uh, nucleotides phosphate. So this is called as the phosphodiester bond and why is it called phosphodiester bond that also I have just shown you, I believe you would have understood this. So let us move back to our uh, concept we were, where we were, we were talking about the 3 prime OH as you can see that I just said 3 prime OH group of the primer. Now the primer as you know that it would be made up of RNA, so it would be RNTP. So primers RNTP, same thing is happening, 3 prime OH of the uh, primers uh, RNTP would be attacking on the incoming DNTP. Okay? So it attacks on the alpha phosphoryl group of the incoming DNTP, this I just told you. Because of this, the pyrophosphate will be removed. Now what do you understand by pyrophosphate? So pyrophosphate is simply PPI that means when two phosphates are removed simultaneously then this is called as pyrophosphate removal. Now over here which two, uh, which two phosphates have been removed? Beta and gamma phosphates have been removed over here. Now understand one more thing that the replication is a template dependent mechanism. Over here you can see that I am talking about this point now that replication is a template dependent mechanism. What do you understand by template dependent? So template dependent simply means that when we are or when the process basically requires a template. Now over here what we are saying is the in the process of replication the, replic the DNA strand is being copied, isn't it? Now definitely if the DNA strand is being copied then the template strand should be there. Template strand means the strand that is being copied. So it should be present, isn't it? So uh, replication means the template, uh, it is a template dependent mechanism or the template, temp presence of template is essential. Next point is Mg2 plus and Zn2 plus are required for DNA polymerase to function. Now you would be knowing that uh, certain enzymes uh, they cannot work without cofactors. So cofactors uh, are generally the 
uh, ions that are required for the enzymes to function. So in the same way DNA polymerase also makes use of two uh, such ions and these are magnesium and zinc Mg2 plus and Zn2 plus are required for the DNA polymerase to function. Next is uh, next point is elongation takes place in 5 prime to 3 prime direction. Now this is very universal thing that the all the processes in biology basically they are taking place from 5 if something is being synthesized right from DNA or RNA if any of these strands are being synthesized then the synthesis will take place from 5 prime to 3 prime direction. Of course in protein synthesis the N terminal is synthesized first and C terminal is synthesized afterwards over there uh, no 5 prime to 3 prime concept is there over there the concept is of N and C terminal and the N terminal is synthesized first we would be talking in great detail about protein synthesis also in, in, in coming days. So uh, elongation this uh, slide we have talked about now let us move our attention towards the next slide. Now this is the slide that I had shown you a little while ago to, sh to uh, 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 acclimatize or adapt you to the structure of RNTPs and uh, DNTPs. Now there is a difference between an RNTP and a DNTP. What is the difference? As I had said that RNTP makes RNTP has basically 3 prime OH and 2 prime OH also both the 3 prime and the 2 prime OH are present in the RNTP but if I talk about the DNTP DNTP just has 3 prime OH okay so this is the basic difference between DNTP and RNTP uh, at times it is asked that uh, can't DNA polymerase add RNTPs or is DNA polymerase's activity uh, specifically towards addition of uh, DNTPs only or can it add RNTPs? So the answer to this question is it cannot add RNTPs. The reason behind this is that uh, since the structure of DNTP and RNTP is different primarily because of the presence of 2 prime OH in RNTP which is not present in DNTP there is a significant difference between the structure of both of them because of that the RNTP cannot accommodate inside the active site of the DNA polymerase and because of this the DNA polymerase cannot add upon the RNTP. So this is the answer to that question. Same thing I have written that uh, RNTPs are sterically excluded from the DNA polymerase active site and because of that the RNTPs cannot be added. Now this I have already told you how a new incoming DNTP is added onto a growing chain. This already we have discussed with the help of this diagram. Let us move forward and talk about the other important things related to DNA elongation in the process of replication. So replication starting point. What is the starting point of a replication? We have already discussed this right. So origin of replication is the starting point remember. Uh, it is the place from which the replication starts in case of prokaryotes and uh, also one thing you should remember that uh, when the DNA replication is taking place what happens is it suppose uh, the DNA replication is starting suppose this is the double stranded uh, DNA because remember the in case of prokaryotes the DNA is circular double stranded I'm not I would not be able to show you the double stranded nature because of uh, the constraints of using a, a double hand over here but I can show you that suppose this is the uh, circular DNA right if this is the circular DNA then if suppose this is the origin of replication right suppose this is the origin of replication so what will happen the DNA replication would be proceeding in a bi-directional way from this point it will be proceeding in this direction also and it will be proceeding in this direction also both directions like this also and like this also and both the forks or both the units will interact somewhere over here or they will both end up somewhere over here just a point opposite to the starting or origin point so suppose this was the origin of replication point and this is the termination point so they will terminate at somewhere over here at this particular spot. So this is what I wanted to tell you. So origin of replication it proceeds to the terminus through the movement of the replication fork. So now this becomes easy to understand that 
it proceeds to the terminus i told you what terminus is through the movement of the replication fork now i've shown you this with the help of a diagram also so this over here is the origin of replication you can see over here this is the origin of replication and uh, as i've already said that the origin of replication it uh, the replication basically is a bidirectional process so uh, it will proceed in this direction also and it will proceed in this direction also and it will end up somewhere over here this is called as the termination site now talking about the process or the speed of uh, dna replication now this dna replication uh, speed in case of prokaryotes is around 1000 base pair per second per fork okay now you would be knowing that uh, the genome size is uh, the that actually the speed of prokaryotes is 1000 base pair per second per fork since there are uh, multi, there are there can be multiple forks that is why over here uh, the speed is uh, present or the speed is written in terms of one fork and the genome size of an e coli is around 4.6 mb okay now in case of eukaryotes the speed can be variable try and understand this the speed, not exactly variable but the speed can be decreased or the speed is usually decreased why in case of prokaryotes the speed is 1000 base pair per second and in case of eukaryotes the speed just becomes one tenth that means 100 base pair per second per fork always remember this that the speed of replication in case of eukaryotes is one tenth of the speed of replication in case of prokaryotes okay now let us move on to the next slide now over here try and understand this i'm going to uh, explain this to you that suppose this is a double stranded dna as you can see this is the double stranded dna and you can see this is the five prime end this is the three prime end this is the three prime end and this is the five prime end now suppose this is the origin of replication so from this origin of replication only the replication would start and as I've already said that the replication will be taking place in both the direction. Now, as you would know that primer is required for the synthesis of DNA, as I've already said. Now, these red colored things are called as the primers. Now, if you can see that the on one particular area, now let us divide this for your clearer understanding. Let us divide this. Okay this into two parts now suppose this is the first part over here this is the second part over here let me just talk about the first part and we can just uh, uh, expand the uh, discussion of the first part into the second part now in the first part you can see that this strand is also present and this strand is also present in the first part this strand is also present and this strand is also present okay now on this strand the uh, this this particular strand let us call the let, let us give this strand a particular name let us just give this strand a name a and uh, this strand is name b okay now in the a strand you can see that this primer is present only once whereas in the b strand there are on the b strand multiple primers are binding what is the reason behind this understand this that this over here is the helicase the helicase is moving in this particular direction over here what does the helicase do it helicase the helicase what does it do it breaks the hydrogen bonds or it or it basically separates the two dna strands this is the function of the helicase now you can see that the helicase has broken these these, these might be the bonds isn't it the helicase has broken these bonds okay now if this is the five prime direction then this would be the three prime direction and on the three prime end the primer binds because the primer on the primer only the strand will start synthesizing towards the five prime direction isn't it because uh, the because this this is the three prime end so the primer binds over here and primers end is five prime because always remember whenever you are binding the primer the primer ends will be in reverse complementarity to the initial order to the template strand so if the template strand has this three prime end this primer will have the five prime end over here and 
just let me rub this in order to make you understand so this uh, primer will have five prime end over here and three prime end over here now as i've already said that the three prime oh would now attack on the incoming dntps and the elongation will take place like this in this strand in the against the a strand only one primer will be used and it will be carried out it would be elongated no other primer would be required why because the strand synthesis is taking place five prime the direction of five prime to three prime right so since the direction is compatible five prime to three prime it can be synthesized continuously with the help of only one primer right so the template strand the temp the uh, the template strand a is helping in the synthesis of continuous dna isn't it now this continuous dna because it is forming continuously without being broken it is using only one primer it is called as leading strand so this this is called as leading strand this blue one the new strand that is synthesized is called as the leading strand synthesis now if i'm talking about the next strand b strand b template strand now you can see that the helicase is moving in this direction and you can see that the let us say that first of all only this much strand has been opened or this much strand has been opened over here let me just rub everything and show you suppose only this much strand has opened now what happens is the primer binds over here this is the primer now understand the ends of the primer since this is the three prime end and this is the five prime end okay so the primer the primer's end over here would be five prime because this five prime end will be matching with the three prime end or it should be in reverse complementarity with the uh, template end so primer's five prime end would be here since the template strands three prime end is in this direction so now what will happen the on the uh, primer this would be the three prime end now dntps would come and attach onto the three prime end and the synthesis will take place like this again a little bit of the strand will open again the primer will bind again the strand would be synthesized like this again when the helicase moves in this direction again the primer will bind and to the primer again the dna strand would be synthesized like this so this will continuously go on happening why this is happening because of the direction problem the synthesis can take place only in 5 prime to 3 prime direction and this can help us in synthesizing only one continuous strand but the complementary strand would be synthesized in a uh, what do you say Discont discontinuous manner right so the discontinuous strand that is being synthesized in multiple parts will be called as the lagging strand or discontinuous synthesis of the lagging strand this process will be called as discontinuous synthesis and the strand that is being synthesized is called as the lagging strand i believe you would have understood the the core thing or the simple sim try uh, if i try and explain you again simply then each portion now i said that initially i divided the entire portion into two parts first part and the second part now if i try to summarize this both sides of the origin of replication will have the leading strand synthesis and the lagging strand synthesis in the leading strand only one primer would be utilized and the synthesis would be continuous but if i talk about the lagging strand the synthesis would be discontinuous because multiple primers would be required and the synthesis will proceed only after a some of the continuous region on the lagging strand has been synthesized because it will be in uh, continuation with the opening of the strand because the strand has opened so the leading strand would be synthesized up to a up to a short distance and then only the primer will bind on to the uh, opposite template and the lagging strand would be synthesized a little portion and then again uh, further some uh, opening of the strand has taken place again a little bit of the template strand again a little bit of the leading strand lagging lagging strand would be synthesized i believe you would have understood this 
let us move forward to the next point now at each growing replication fork now this is important you should be knowing about this now there are few differences between the leading strand and the lagging strand what are the differences the first point is synthesis in the leading strand for leading strand synthesis is in the same direction as the movement of replication fork it is but natural because the helicase is moving and following the helicase dna polymerase is moving that is why it is continuously synthesized but if i talk about the lagging strand then it is involving discontinuous synthesis as i have already said so uh, in case of the leading strand synthesis is continuous but in case of lagging strand it is discontinuous only one primer is required in case of the leading strand but multiple primers are required in case of the lagging strand and uh, the synthesis is taking place in 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the same thing goes for the lagging strand also the synthesis is from 5 prime to 3 prime direction one more thing is that after 100 to 2 uh, 1000 to 2000 nucleotides on the leading strand synthesis on the leading strand when they are synthesized around 1000 to 2000 nucleotides are added onto the leading strand then the uh, synthesis of the lagging strand again starts okay the so short pieces of dna that are formed are called as okazaki fragments so if you see the screen if you are not able to see let me just move myself so short pieces of dna are called as the okazaki fragments and new primers are needed for each okazaki fragment that means for synthesis of the each okazaki for synthesis of each okazaki fragment new primer would be required that means for lagging strand synthesis multiple primers are required and for leading strand synthesis only one primer would be required so this was all about the differences between the leading and the lagging strand this is very important point it is often asked in the university level examinations also and apart from this the uh, competitive examinations also so this again is a photograph in which you can see that the continuous and the discontinuous strand synthesis you can see over here this is the continuous strand synthesis over here uh, continuously the strand is being synthesized from the 5 prime to the 3 prime end and over here you can see that multiple okazaki fragments are formed okazaki 1 2 and 3 and for each okazaki fragment what do you require you require the different primers so this is what i wanted to show you in this particular diagrammatic representation this is the leading strand template i'm talking about the template right if i'm talking about the leading strand now this is the leading strand what about this one this is the lagging strand template lagging strand template and the strand that is synthesized is called as a lagging strand this is your lagging strand so i believe you would have understood this now let us move forward on to the next slide now the size of the okazaki fragments okay the okazaki fragments have sizes of around 1000 to 2000 nucleotides in bacterial cells and around 100 to 200 nucleotides in case of the eukaryotic cell now the replication in case of the uh, prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes it is semi discontinuous now what do you understand by semi discontinuous mode of replication so there is a difference often i have seen students confusing between the semi discontinuous and uh, uh, semi conservative so semi conservative is simply when a new strand is synthesized on an older strand and they together they are present together that means one strand is older strand one strand is newer strand so this is called as semi conservative mode of replication but if i'm talking about semi discontinuous mode of replication this states that one strand synthesis is continuous and the other strand synthesis is discontinuous as i have just shown that means one strand is a leading strand another strand is a lagging strand why are you calling this leading or a lagging strand why such peculiar names have been given so the answer to this question is simple uh, the synthesis of leading strand takes place first and then after that the lagging strand is following that is why the these names have been given now uh, okazaki 
our Okazaki fragments are later joined together because you you have seen that in the leading in the lagging strand sorry uh, multiple Okazaki fragments would be present and these Okazaki fragments can be joined together with the help of DNA ligase later on. Always remember that leading strand synthesis is continuous, lagging strand synthesis is discontinuous. So with this we come to the end of this particular slide. Let us move on and talk about the DNA polymerase 3. Now this is the main enzyme of DNA uh, replication and it is functioning in the process of elongation. So what happens is DNA polymerase 3 is a holo enzyme complex. Now uh, basically let us talk about the overall uh, structure of this DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase is having two copies of the catalytic core and two copies of the sliding clamp, one copy of the sliding clamp loader and uh, the sliding clamp loader is called as the gamma complex and it bridges the two polymerase 3 catalytic cores within the DNA polymerase 3. I would show you each and everything with the help of a diagram and come back to this slide. Now recent studies show that a third catalytic uh, side is also present, a third catalytic core is also present. I would be talking about that also. So having keep keeping this in mind, let us let me move on to the structure of DNA polymerase. So uh, just a brief review about the uh, what I have said in the previous slide. So catalytic core, I told you about catalytic core. Catalytic core has alpha, epsilon and theta subunits. This is important and is asked in the examination and two polymerase and uh, there are uh, polymerase three, two catalytic cores basically. One core is basically synthesizing the leading strand, the other core is synthesizing the lagging strand. What do you mean by two polymerase three catalytic cores? So there are two alpha, epsilon or theta subunits. Okay two of each or one of them and one is responsible to synthesize the leading strand, the other one is responsible to synthesize the lagging strand. Next uh, point is the primer is formed from the primase and uh, this primer is RNA in nature and primase is the enzyme that is involved in the formation of the primer and this also is connected with the helicase and uh, when basically this uh, the primer is attached by the primase then it is extended by the DNA polymerase 3. Now there is another term that you should be aware about replisome. Now what is this replisome? When you are calling DNA polymerase 3 oloenzyme plus primase plus helicase if you are if you are addressing all of these three together then you can use uh, one particular word and that word is called as replisome. Right. So what is replisome? Replisome comprises of DNA polymerase 3 oloenzyme, primase and helicase. Okay. Now let me show you the diagrammatic representation. Now over here you can see this is the catalytic unit. I have already told you that what is the catalytic unit comprised of alpha subunit, epsilon subunit and the theta subunit. So these three subunits are present in the catalytic core and I also said to you that there are two catalytic cores that are present. So one catalytic core is over here, the other catalytic core is over here. So this also we have talked about. Now recent studies show that there is a third catalytic core also but for your purposes we just need to understand that there are two catalytic cores. Now uh, there is this tau, you can see that this is tau and it acts basically to dimerize the two of the core enzymes. Now this was one core, this was the other core. Basically this tau is just dimerizing, joining both of them together. Apart from this, you can see that this is the gamma, this is the epsilon, this is the delta, this is the zeta, this is the delta. Now these are the different subunits of the, uh, the DNA polymerase 3. Now let me just briefly talk to you about each one of them or a uh, few of them. So this is psi and this is uh, involved in the interaction basically. This delta is used as a clamp opener. Okay. This the prime is used as a clamp loader and this is used for interaction with the SSB zeta. Now let me just show you that another diagrammatic representation. This 
can you, you can see that this alpha epsilon and theta these are the important core enzymes and now these two cores are present one over here and one over here the tau was used for the uh, you can say that dimerization of the structure and this is called as the gamma complex now what is the gamma complex basically used for gamma complex is utilized for loading and unloading of the beta clamp now what is beta clamp beta clamp remember is not a part of this entire structure right it is not a part of the dna polymerase this beta is basically it is a clamp like thing now beta clamp is used for clamping onto the subunit right you are you are is not the subunit on the dna the clamp is just functioning like this you want to grab the dna strand with the help of the beta clamp okay so it unloads this gamma complex what is it doing it is loading and unloading the beta clamp cyclically for the lagging strand synthesis now you should know that the dna polymerase basically it is present on the strand at one moment and it is coming out of the strand at the other moment why is that so i'm specifically talking about the lagging strand now lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously and for this discontinuous synthesis the dna polymerase should come out and go in should come out and go in this like this so for this purpose beta clamp is required now this beat on the beta clamp only or with the help of the beta clamp only the dna polymerase is joining or binding to the strand now this beta clamp is like this it is open and it needs to be closed and when it is closed only the dna polymerase can move on right so opening and closing of this beta clamp is in the hands of the gamma complex i believe you would have understood this let us move on to the next point each okazaki fragment it forms the rna primer for the uh, the rna primer for the previous fragment is removed and the five by the five prime to three prime exonuclease activity of dna polymerase one what i'm trying to say over here so when the even each of the okazaki fragment is formed rna primer would be required but we are continuously or the system entire system is continuously removing the rna primers why because you cannot join the rna with the dna continuously when the primer has been synthesized what you need to do is you need to you, when the strand has been synthesized or the elongated then what you need to do is you need to remove the primer so the rna primer is removed by the 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity by of dna polymerase 1 so dna polymerase 1 has the ability to remove the primer after the synthesis of the strand after the synthesis of the new strand the primer is removed by dna polymerase 1 now there definitely would now be left with a gap there would be a gap that would be left with because the primer has been removed and uh, the duty of the filling of this gap is also performed by dna polymerase 1 that means it also fills up the gap that has been created because of the removal of the primer dna ligase what is the function of dna ligase it joins the uh, the two okazaki fragments together so in eukaryotes and archaea the dna ligase it requires atp but in case of e coli dna ligase requires nad plus this again is very important it has been asked in the examination now dna polymerase all the all basically all dna polymerase have these two activities 5 prime to 3 prime polymerase activity and 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity what is this exonuclease activity used for for the purpose of proofreading what do you understand by proofreading if a false or if a wrong nucleotide has been added then the dna polymerase knows and it comes back and it deletes the wrong nucleotide and it again starts synthesizing the correct nucleotides this is called as a proofreading activity now for coming back and deleting this strand this nucleotide it has to have a exonuclease activity and this exonuclease activity functions in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction right i would talk more about dna polymerase one later on Uh, dna polymerase 1 but dna polymerase 1 has very important another activity also now all the other dna polymerases have 5 prime to 3 prime polymerase and 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activities but 
if i am specifically talking about dna polymerase 1 then it has got a another activity also that is very peculiar to it and it is the 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity and it is used for the purpose that we just talked about that is the primer removal right for the removing of the primers it is used for now let us move on to the next slide one more important uh, uh, enzyme that we should talk about is the topo isomerase now you should understand this when the helicase is moving very fast what it is doing it is doing is it is breaking the hydrogen bonds of the two dna strands now it's just like suppose two of your two uh, you and your another friend is holding the two ends of a rope i mean to say is the two parts of the rope and you are just pulling like this in opposite directions what will happen the dna the rope will open up to a certain distance and after that there would be a knot that would be uh, formed at after a some distance there would be a knot that would be formed and because of that knot the dna will not be opening any further the same thing happens in case of the dna strands now helicase is breaking the bond between the dna strand and after some time now there is a knot or a supercoiling that exists at in the dna in until and unless this supercoiling is relieved the helicase cannot move forward and the replication cannot be continued so for this purpose another enzyme is used and the name of the enzyme is topo isomerase what is the function of topo isomerase it relieves the positive supercoiling now what is this positive supercoiling positive supercoiling is formed because of the helicase running okay so i would be taking separate lecture on uh, uh, how does topo isomerase function but in this particular case you just need to know that it just relieves the uh, tension that is built up in the dna strands it relieves the positive supercoiling and uh, there are different types of DNA, uh, there are different types of topo isomerase that are present. For instance, topo isomerase 1 and topo isomerase 2. In case of eukaryotes, or f first of all, let us take a uh, talk about the uh, E. coli. In case of E. coli, DNA gyrase is present, that is uh, type 2 topo isomerase. And if I talk about the eukaryotes, so in case of eukaryotes, topo isomerase 1b is present. And what does it do? Again, relaxation of the supercoils. Now, what are the inhibitors of the, um, what do you say, topo isomerases? So, first inhibitor is of uh, DNA gyrase or uh, DNA topo, is topo isomerase. If I'm talking about prokaryotes, remember, so because in prokaryotes only DNA gyrase is present, right? So, in case of DNA gyrase, the inhibitors are quinolone antibiotics, example, nelidixic acid, or if you talk about the let me just move myself a little bit yeah so fluorinated derivatives if i talk about fluorinated de fluorinated derivatives norfloxacin and ciprofloxacin are other examples now uh, both norfloxacin and ciprofloxacin are binding to the gyrase a protein okay and uh, if i try and uh, I have made a trick out of this so just a minute yes so November May Norway Namibia and China so NOV means Novobiosin NOR Norway means Norfloxacin and NAM Namibia means Nalidixic Acid and C C for Ciprofloxacin so November, May, Norway, Namibia and China, Jayenge, you can use that since it is a Hindi word. So you can try and use that or you can use another thing, another trick if you want. So these are the uh, quinolone derivatives, quinolone antibiotics and fluorinated derivatives are the two basic uh, uh, drugs that can be used to bind on the uh, topo isomerase or DNA gyrase in prokaryotes and inhibit the DNA replication in prokaryotes. Let us move forward and talk about the next uh, antibiotic. I did mention this in the trick. You can see that I had talked about Novobiosin. 
it is present uh, over here also i have no biosin basically interacts with the gyrase b protein so if i talk about gyrase a protein uh, to gyrase a norfloxacin uh, and ciprofloxacin these two drugs are binding to gyrase a but if i am talking about gyrase b novo biosin is acting okay so apart from this i would uh, this brings us to the end of the uh, elongation mechanism of dna replication apart from this i would just like to mention that uh, gate bt crash course is running from 10th december and uh, this course is of uh, one month so there are certain classes some classes that we are still having so the fees is rupees 3800 we have completed all the important topics we have the pdf notes recordings tests everything and apart from this we have, we have also now the bp recordings are also available gate bt uh, crash course recordings are also available if you are uh, willing to join the course now also you can join and uh, take the recordings from us and you can study and prepare uh, in a better way so i believe you would have understood well this particular lecture if you have, if you like the lecture please hit the like button subscribe to our channel and don't forget to press the bell icon so that you can get all the updates from us thank you so much have a good day